Melon heads, you bear market melon heads, you. Happy Friday, everybody. I hope you guys are doing well. Hi, mom. Hi, dad. I love you guys. Hello to all my regulars in the comments. The weekend is nary upon us, and that's time. It's time for my favorite part of the week, my live stream. So, the number to watch 38, 37, 25. Thanks to my man, Greg Manorino, for doing the math. That is a 20% level below the all-time high closing, which was, I believe, on January 3rd of this year. January 5th was the actual all-time high, but we didn't close there. We closed lower on January 5th. So the all-time close on January 3rd was 4,796.56, and 20% down from that level would be 38 37 25. Now, we traded under that level for quite a while today. Looks like the market caught a little bit of a bounce about an hour ago. Figures as soon as I made the thumbnail with the bear on it, the market caught a bounce. That's usually how this goes. Uh, but rallied a little bit, but not all that much, to be honest with you. If that's the only thing, if that's all the algorithms have when we hit that level, that little bit of buying that we've seen, that is not a good sign. All right, just not a good sign for the market. Now, I'd also add, this is options expiration today. All right, you've got options expiring, and that means a lot of stock is about to change hands. And I don't know what that's going to look like in this last hour of trading, but there's going to be a lot of these transactions are going to get rolled up in the next couple of minutes. Uh, also, folks, I have to mention here, I don't know if you guys can still hear me, but I got to get this out there before it happens. There is some serious weather coming through my area right now. And as we speak, my internet is hicking up on me. So I don't know if I'm going to get booted from this live stream while I'm talking here. I, I can hear the thunder cracking over my shoulder here right now. It is coming. Um, I don't know if I'm going to lose internet. If that happens, I'll be right back on. Sometimes the power flickers. It's just enough that my router has to reboot and everything. So if we get cut off during this stream, I'll start right back up. And uh, also, I have to mention, right b before we even got started here, I got my man Dakota Prairie. Thank you so much for the super chats while we were waiting. He already uh, sent me a couple of super chats. He said, remember when I said the crash had just begun? And I do remember that. That was certainly at a much higher level than we are at right now. And uh, nor do I think the crash is over. Um, can we even call it a crash yet? Right? Apparently, we can't actually call it a crash until we're 20% down from our current level which we are not yet, not our current level, our previous high. And we have not yet hit that 20% threshold. And Dakota Prairie also said in another super chat, the coming bond market crash will be the mother of all crashes. Uh, look, I don't want to use too much hyperbolic rhetoric. I, I know I kind of have that tendency. I am something of a perma bear. And, you know, like I rarely come on this channel and say, hey, everything's going to be great. It's going to be all good. Uh, but Dakota, I. I don't think you're really that far off there because we are at the tail end right now of a 50-year cycle of easy money, or you could say 40 if you want to start in 1981 at just after Paul Volcker's rate hikes. We're at the end of a 40-year easy money train. And now that we have this inflation problem, we can't just use easy money to bail ourselves out. If we, if we bail ourselves out with easy money, as I think they're likely to do, they will destroy the currency. And that's even worse. So it's like we have a choice right now between 1929 and worse than 1929. So I don't think it's all that hyperbolic, Dakota Prairie, to say the coming bond market crash will be the mother of all crashes. And, and we'll look at the chart of the 10-year Treasury yield in a little bit and just show you what that looks like if we do get anything even close to a reversion to the mean in those interest rates. Yeah. I mean, that would be the mother of all crashes in the bond market. You are right on there. So thank you very much for the support of the channel and for the Super Chats, Dakota Prairie. I really appreciate that. And I've got Johnny Phil Harmon. Thank you, Johnny Phil Harmon, for your Super Chat. He says, buy yourself some wake-up juice, Melon King. Well, thank you, Johnny. I will buy myself some wake-up juice. I'd hook this stuff up to an IV if I could. We run on caffeine and anxiety over here in Melon Land. And both are in ample supply. So thank you very much, Johnny. I appreciate that. 
And I think with that, it's a pretty good time to shrink my big fat melon of a head. And uh, reverse repos, we're not looking at reverse repos just yet. Let's check out what the markets are doing right now. And there's so much going on right now. I got to refresh the screen regular. We are at 38, 39, 48 on the S&P, which is a little over two points above bear market territory. So you, you can see, you know, right around 1.30 p.m., which is like seriously right when I made the thumbnail with the bear on it, is when the market caught a little bit of a bounce, but not much of a bounce. So we're, we're right now just hovering about above that level. I think there's going to be a lot of volume in the close today, so I don't know which way we go from there. Let's see how the Dow is doing while we're at it. The Dow is down 395. At one point today, it was down close to 500, I believe, or 1.27% at the moment. And the NASDAQ, leading the way lower, is down 2.18%, or 248 points. Now, yesterday... I saw that the NASDAQ was actually doing a little bit better than the other indexes in the morning. They were all down yesterday morning. They weren't down all that much. Uh, but I put this on my Patreon that I, it looked like the market was reversing. And I sold my SQQQ calls yesterday morning. And I unloaded some of my VIX position. And it was the right trade yesterday because the market resumed higher from there. However, I missed out on this big dip today. So... Um, if you're still holding your SQQQ, unlike me, well, you're doing all right right now, aren't you? So um, I did put some of that VIX position back on today. Shout out to Devin Brines, who has been helping me out with that trade. Um, so right now, suffice it to say, the market is just, we're bouncing right around that bear market level. Not really sure where it wants to go from there. And I got a couple more. You guys are in the super chats now. Thank you guys so much for your support of the channel. I really appreciate it. I've got Sean Palmquist. Sean Palmquist says, Jack, been following you since your early Reddit posts. Ah, since the Wall Street Silver days. Going way back, Sean. He says, appreciate you sharing your knowledge as it's made me better and more informed investor. Well, thank you, Sean. Appreciate that. I'm glad you found it helpful. Uh, I'm glad you're learning. And, and thanks for sticking with me from, from the beginning in that original rant on Wall Street Silver way, way back. And what was that? February of 2021. That's where this channel sprang out of. So thank you, Sean. I appreciate the support of the channel and for the uh, the nostalgia for the Wall Street Silver Days. Still a regular in that Reddit forum, although I post my videos here now. And there's Miracle Oil. Hello, Miracle Oil. Thank you for the super chat. Says, Jack, what's the difference between SQQQ call and a QQQ put? Really not any different, Miracle Oil. I mean, you're both of them are essentially a short bet on the Nasdaq, uh, so um, I, I would have to compare the performance of one versus the other, you know, at, at a similar strike or at similar percentage moves, and see see which one outperforms the other. I'm I'm not sure which would do better. I believe SQQQ is levered. Um, I believe it's a two x or a three x ETF. I, I should know this off the top of my head, but I don't. Let's bring that up real quick. So I believe SQQQ will give you a bigger move one way or another. So if you're right, you are right big. If you're wrong, you're wrong big. Yeah, so the, it's the ultra pro short QQQ is what SQQQ is. And that is, man, there's a lot of Qs. That one, uh, where is it? The index includes 100. Sh shoot, it usually says it in the description. But I believe this is a... This is a levered fund. This should 2x the NASDAQ's move. And right now, the NASDAQ, it looks like a 3x because the NASDAQ is down 2.2% today, but the QQQ is up 6.8%. So this is a 3x levered ETF versus QQQ buying a put on that. That is only a 1x levered fund. So this this should make a more drastic move. So that's, that's the difference there. You see more downside for retail? Yes, absolutely, Miracle Oil. I see more downside for retail. Inflation is going to keep squeezing the retail, inv uh, not the retail investor, the consumer. And look, even if inflation numbers come down, I want to remind you guys that inflation is a rate of change, okay? It's not, if, if we see inflation come down, understand that means prices are still going up, all right? So as long as inflation remains higher than wage gains, which they will, that means the consumer has less money to spend on retail. All right, so even if we were to see a 5% CPI print, 
if wage gains are only 3%, that's still 2% less discretionary spending. So that's still bad for retail. So inflation needs to come way, way down in order for retail to catch any kind of a break right now. And that's just not going to happen. I don't think that's happening right now. So yeah, I see a lot more downside for retail. I would not want to touch anything associated with discretionary spending right now. Just, I, I think it's toxic. I wouldn't go anywhere near it. My take on Costco earnings, I don't follow Costco that closely, to be honest with you. Um, I mean, personally, I shop at Costco. Costco, you see, here's the thing with Costco. They are a retailer, and Costco's bottom line is dependent on impulse buys, right? Costco gets you in the door with discounts on K-cups for your coffee maker or garbage bags or paper plates, right? Like th these these consumer staple items that they sell at almost no profit. That's how Costco gets you in the door. But in order to get to that stuff, they march you past the jewelry and they march you past the big screen TVs and the high-end electronics, right? So, so Costco's bottom line is dependent on getting you to impulse buy while you're there to buy something else. And I don't think, I think the consumer is going to be more vigilant of that in the situation that he's in, right? He's going to Costco for the same reason he always goes to Costco. I don't think they'll get any fewer shoppers than they normally do, but I think the average Costco shopper is less likely to splurge on that big seasonal item or less likely to buy that big flat screen now because he's got less discretionary income. So that that's probably gonna hit Costco's top line. Um, now, as far as their bottom line, Costco makes most of its profit off of the memberships so I, I would really have to look closer at Costco's financials. Um, that being said, the number doesn't jump, the, the, the name doesn't jump out at me as like a really good pick. Um, NASDAQ down 30%. Can Dow go down further from here? Yes, the Dow can go down further from here, but the Dow is going to get some help um, from commodities and some of the base industrials and things like that, which the Dow will outperform the NASDAQ and the S&P. Let's put it that way because the Dow is less tech heavy. And thoughts on shorting Bitcoin? I guess you, I, I personally wouldn't. I, I don't short Bitcoin. Um, I still buy regular amounts of Bitcoin. Bitcoin's probably going lower from here. I've never shorted Bitcoin, so I don't know the mechanics of that or how the trade works out. Um, but I think Tether's going to pop uh, probably... I mean, possibly sometime very soon. They lost their peg for a little while, so they could be heading much lower from here. Uh, so I hope I got to all those questions. By the way, guys, I hear the thunder. It's really starting to rip behind me right now. So again, if we drop, I will be right back. Can't change the weather. Uh, what's up? Mike Bender from Robin RC Models says, Lex, next leg down in June, tether likely to pop one-seventh. USDT market cap redeemed in one week while Bitcoin down a quarter. That's an interesting correlation, uh, Mike, that Bitcoin dropped 25% on just a one seventh, what is that, about 12 and a half something percent drop in, or about a 15% drop in Tether's market cap. So that just goes to show you how much of the Bitcoin market's liquidity is dependent on Tether. All right, so. Yeah, there was what, like nine, almost $10 billion worth of Tether was redeemed off of $86 billion we started at, um, and Bitcoin just absolutely tanked. So let me just reiterate on Tether and on Bitcoin, all right? I have thought Tether was a scam since 2018, and Tether has the possibility of bringing Bitcoin way, way down. But I want to make a distinction between Tether and Bitcoin because I think Bitcoin will survive Tether and any crash in Bitcoin prices that happens because of Tether will be a generational buying opportunity. That's my personal opinion, all right? It's risky and it's speculative, I know, but we've got two more of those halving cycles coming up at the end of this year. And again, I want to draw the distinction. Bitcoin is a decentralized public ledger. Tether is a centralized it, it's they're basically trying to be a central bank is what they're trying to be. They're not. They suck at it, and it, it's going to go down in flames. So Tether is very much the anti-Bitcoin. Don't conflate the two. When Tether pops and people are going to say, see, I told you Bitcoin was a scam all along. Understand, Tether is not Bitcoin. 
All right. And by the way, I do not mess around in altcoins. I don't get into the dog coins. I don't get into and any of those other ones. Maybe some of those survive, maybe not. Most of them are going to be worthless in the end, so I don't touch those. And thank you, Mike. I really appreciate the super chat and the support of the channel, sir. Uh, all right, real quick, before we get to AK, I want to just revisit the indexes here and see where we're at because we are at 3.30. We're a half hour away from close. S&P still grinding a little bit higher now, 38.53, still above that bear market territory, down 46 points on the day. Dow also grinding a little bit higher, 30,935, down 317 on the day. NASDAQ is still leading the pack lower, down 1.73%, just under 200 points lower. And Mr. AK, hello AK from New Zealand. Thank you very much for the super chat. It says, please look at about November 2007, the top of the market, S&P 500, till about July. Tell me if it's not the same fractal as right now. Hope I'm wrong. Okay, July, we're looking at 2007. Let me see if the chart will take me back. Oh, there, there's my messy charts. We're going to go all the way back, way back, way back to 2007. Looking at the top from November of 2007 till about July. Okay, so there's November 2007, we'll say October of 2007 to about July of 09, are you saying? Okay, I see where we're at here to about July of 08. All right, I'm seeing what you're seeing there. Now we got to fast forward. I don't know an easy way to do this to jump around. But you know what? We are looking at a pretty similar move, aren't we? Almost identical. You know, there, I've, some, I've seen some people like clip a segment of the candles and drag it over another to see if it lines up. I've never quite been able to do that. But man, that does look similar, AK. It looks eerily similar. And there are a lot of similarities between what's going on now and what's going on in the days before the global financial crisis. I had a fantastic discussion with Kirian Von Hest yesterday, a.k.a. Deso Games on Twitter. Um, by the way, that interview will be coming out. I'll be releasing that in pieces over the next couple of days. I had a great discussion with Kirian. He is just an absolute brilliant, brilliant mind. And... He went and pulled a Michael Burry. He, he opened up the MBB, which is the uh, Mortgage Backed Security ETF, and he looked at the bonds that make up the MBB, and he found 660 FICO scores in there in a AAA-rated Mortgage Backed Securities ETF. He found 660 FICO scores, which are not supposed to be in a AAA-rated bond or AAA-rated ETF. So that means there is less than AAA rated bonds making up a AAA rated bond ETF. Does that sound familiar? That sounds an awful lot like 2007, 2008, doesn't it? And uh, that ETF is actually trading lower than it did at the bottom of the global financial crisis right now. So forget housing prices for a second. If you look at mortgage bonds, they're trading as low as they did in the GFC. How are, how are home prices still as high as they are? I don't know, um, but thank you very much, AK. I appreciate that super chat, and uh, I appreciate the insight. I, I have to go look a little closer and see, do the, do the peaks and troughs line up or the percentage moves the same? I, I couldn't tell you, but man, just at a cursory glance, it sure looks very similar. So thank you very much, AK. I appreciate that. Free Leg Summer, thank you for your super, sir. And he says, did you guys stack some more food today? <laughs> Actually, I, as a matter of fact, I was at the food store earlier today. Um, I was in a rush to get home because the market was opening. I went early this morning and I didn't grab my extra bag of rice. Son of a gun. I'm supposed to buy an extra 20 pound bag of rice or a couple pounds of dried beans every time I go shopping. I am remiss today, free like summer. So the next time I go to the store, I'm going to have to buy two big bags of rice or some extra dried beans. But thank you very much, sir. I appreciate the super nonetheless. All right, guys. Now we mentioned a minute ago. Something about why home prices aren't going lower. Now, this may not be why home prices aren't going lower. 
But let's file this one under real estate and also stupid things the government has tried to do today. I just saw this in the LA Times and folks, you just can't fix stupid and California seems to run on stupid. It fuels them. It is the fuel to their fire in the formerly great state of California. New California homebuyers could soon get government cash for down payment. And isn't that just like the government? What do you do when you're looking at a home, a housing bubble that's about to burst? What do you do when people already can't afford homes? I don't know. Maybe you subsidize an industry. And let me just ask you, anybody who's ever, say, paid for health care or anybody who's ever paid for college, what happens to something when the government gets involved and tries to make it more affordable? What happens? Prices rise. Prices rise like crazy. So what California is doing, they're going to give home buyers. Let me let me bring up the text of this article. I, I couldn't believe it. It was something like, where is it? Oh, it's the California Dream for All program. They make it sound so unicorns and rainbows, don't they? The California Dream for All. Yeah, great. Here's what they're going to do. All right. On Wednesday, Senate President Pro Tem Tony Atkins from San Diego said um, she unveiled a program that a state budget proposal, which state's already operating at a loss. I don't know where they're going to get the money from, but they will lend prospective buyers 17% of a home's purchase price as a way to lower their mortgage costs and reduce their down payments. So you get 17% cash from the government for a down payment on your house. Once a homeowner sells or transfers or refinances their house, according to the program's outline, the owner would pay back to the revolving fund an amount equal to 17% of the home's value. Wouldn't you just love, love, love to be co-owner of your home with the state of California? Wouldn't you just love that? Do you need, tell me, will you need to get, since... The state of California will hold equity in your home. Are you going to need their approval before you remodel? If you want to paint, if you want to do something, you know, do, you, do, you, do they need to sign off on the sale price of the home? Do you need to get the state government's approval to sell your home? What, what wonderful strings might be attached the second you let the government take a 17% equity stake in your house? Oh, and by the way, you still owe them property taxes every month, every year. You don't pay those to take your home. And now they've got 17% equity in it. What could go wrong? What's the worst thing that could happen, right? Maybe I'm just paranoid, right? Me and my, my anti-government conspiracy nut, nuttiness. Sure, let's give the government 17% equity in our homes, right? I mean, they wouldn't do, do wrong by us, would they? They, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't mess up the world so much that millions of people are on the brink of starvation. They wouldn't start wars for no reason, right? No, they wouldn't, I don't know, create diseases and labs and turn them loose on the world. No, sure, sure. Take 17% of my home, please. And what's that going to do the second they offer this cash? That is carte blanche for every prospective seller in California to just raise their asking price by 17%. That's what's going to happen. The homes will remain every bit as unaffordable for these people. The prices will just go up even more, which means... The banks, the mortgage brokers, they end up being the beneficiaries because they collect more interest. It's all that happens, folks. The banks love this. The banks just absolutely love it. So let's file that under stupid things the government has done today. And we're not done. Mike Bender from Robin RC Models again says, Germany, the government wants 20,000 euro one-time payment to people turning 18 if their parents don't own any property. Go figure. The government wants a 20,000 euro one-time payment to people turning 18. Happy birthday, here's 20,000 euros. And what's it going to be paid for? Where are they going to get that money from? Probably by taxing the heck out of anybody who does own property to the point where they need to sell their property in order to pay the tax that is probably going to go to pay these 20... Just another... Another program that is designed to make slaves of us. All right. They want to make slaves of us. But if you watch this channel, it will not be happening to you. Ain't going to be happening to me. No, thank you. I got my chickens. I don't need it. My chickens will save me.
All right, it is 340. Let's see what's going on in the indexes again. I heard, saw somebody just said S&P mooning. Moon is not what I would use, but look at that rally in the close. 3880, now only down 20 points for the day. So I, I guess the market is going to reject the bear for now. It doesn't look like we're going to close. I mean, something really drastic would have to happen in the next 20 minutes for us to close higher. Dow's also rallying right along with it now. 31,146, only down 100 points on the day. Are we going to close positive today? No. We could. Only down a half a percent. 30% on the Dow. NASDAQ is now down less than 1%. 104 points. Look at that rally in the indexes. What is going on here? My goodness. Well, looks like the bear will just have to wait, folks. Wow, me and my big mouth with that with that thumbnail. I just had to put the bear in my thumbnail, didn't I? Let's see what the debt market is doing. U.S. Treasury yield, 2.787, and the decline in Treasury yields continues. Now remember, folks, bond yields and bond prices are inversely correlated. So when you see bond yields going down, that means bond values are going up. That means people have put money into bonds today. All right, that is a risk off move. When people buy bonds, they are they are taking risk off the table. They are fleeing to quality. Although with this rally in the stock markets, I'm surprised we're not seeing these yields start climbing again. Money's not coming from the bond market. I'm not sure where it's coming from. But let's take a look at this. Somebody had mentioned, I believe it was Dakota Prairie, had talked about the mother of all crashes if the bond market were to crash. And there is a reason for that. There's a reason why I agree with that. Just take a look here. This is the yield on the U.S. 10-year Treasury. And, well, heck, let's uh, let's draw this. Let's take off. This is a linear. Okay, this is a linear chart. Even if we were to just revert to, say, where we were in the mid-70s, right, before Volcker's rate hikes, I mean, look how high yields would have to rise just to get back to there, 7.7%. Let's say 7%. How far would bond prices have to fall? How much wealth would have to evaporate in the thin air in order to get bond yields back up to 7% or 7.5%? And how much money would the interest on the U.S. government's national debt, that $30 trillion debt, how much would that be? Just interest alone, if we were to go back to 7%, it would bankrupt the government. It would absolutely bankrupt the government. And it looks like, I mean, right now, look, straight line up. I mean, if you would have asked me months ago, I would have said, no way we ever even get this high. And look where we're at right now. I mean, we went as high as 3.17 on the 10-year Treasury. And we've got another 50 basis point hike coming up in another, what, three weeks? I think June 16th is the last day of the next FOMC meeting. So we're going to go another half a point higher from there, 50 basis points. Rates are still going higher, folks. I know we've got this temporary sell-off that's going on right now. Not temporary sell-off. This temporary flight to safety in the bond market. Yields are dropping a little bit. But we got another 50 basis point hike coming next month. So these yields are going higher. <sighs> I don't know. Speaking of stupidity of the government, check out this one. Let me know if this one makes you want to grind your teeth a little bit. Saw this on Twitter today in the Irish Times. Corporate jets to escape the EU's green aviation fuel tax. Gotta love these people. These are the people who make decisions for all of us. These are the people who are in Davos right now. And if I criticize them too much, the growth of my channel is going to stop for another month. I can hear my moderator, Mish, in the background right now. I can't actually hear him, but he's grinding his teeth right now. He's saying to himself, Jack, don't do it. Don't do it, Jack. Don't get yourself shadow banned again. <laughs> I made a video a couple weeks about uh, the big do-over, we'll call it. Can you tell what I'm talking about when I talk about Davos and the big do-over? Can you guess what I was talking about in that video? Anyways, I thought the video was hilarious, but funny thing happened right after I made that video. The views on my channel <laughs> fell off a cliff. And I didn't get any new subscribers, hardly any, for about a month. No growth at all. Shadow ban. Shadow ban.
But I cannot let a story like this go unspoken of. Corporate jets to escape the EU's green aviation fuel tax. Executive jets will escape plans to tax polluting aviation fuels, according to draft proposals to be presented by the European Commission on Wednesday. The Commission plans to set an EU-wide minimum tax for aviation fuels as it seeks to meet more ambitious targets to fight, to fight climate change. The proposal would impose an EU-wide EU minimum tax. We talked about that. From 2023, the minimum tax rate for aviation fuel would start at zero and increase gradually over a 10-year period until the full rate is imposed. The draft proposal did not specify what the final rate will be. That's great, isn't it? They're going to raise taxes, and they're not going to tell us how much. They're just going to say, we're going to gradually raise them to question mark. But, but, look at this next paragraph. Executive jets. However, the minimum EU tax rate would not apply to cargo-only flights or pleasure flights and business aviation, a term that covers executive jets. Isn't that just so magnanimous of them? Aren't these guys so great that they are going to impose a no-limit tax on us, on our travel? If we want to go visit mum, we got to pay their potentially infinite high aviation fuel tax, you know, for the unicorns and the rainbows to fight climate change and all that stuff. We got to pay it. But their private jets that use hundreds of times more fuel per seat mile than com commercial travel, hundreds of times more carbon emissions and more fuel consumed per seat mile, they're exempt. Ain't they great? Aren't these guys great? They're just adorable, aren't they? I wonder why we hate them. My goodness. Where are the pitchforks? Where are the torches? Honey, bring me my pitchfork and torches. We're going out tonight. Something special planned. Date night. Pitchforks and torches. We're going to Davos. Can you believe this stuff? Can you believe? I mean, for them to do this so blatantly out in the open, we know they're hypocrites, right? We know they're absolute frauds. But my God, at least pretend you don't have to insult my intelligence at the same time. Jeez, these guys are... These guys are the worst, aren't they? And, and they will tell us they're doing it for our own good. Remember, we'll own nothing and be happy. We'll eat bugs, we'll own nothing, and we'll be happy. Uh, I tell you. And uh, there's AK again in the Super Chats. Thank you, AK, very much. And AK says, percentage moves and timing may not be quite the same. I believe this is the blueprint for the future. How can I email you my chart? Uh, AK, thank you very much again for the super chat, for the support of the channel. Uh, if you go to the About Me on my channel page, uh, I do have an email listed there, and you'll be able to find me that way. Or you could send me a private message on Twitter at JG Nuke. That is also linked on the About Me page, so you can send me messages either way there. Got to warn you, bud, I get a lot of messages. I try to read every single one of them. I can't always respond to all of them, although I try to. There's only so many hours in the day. Thank you very much the support of the channel once again all right we are now 11 minutes away from the open and market's still heading higher still heading higher now only down 12 points in the s p are we going to get a positive close for the day 38 87 down 13 and a half points the dow is at 31 176 down 76 points or a quarter of a percent and the nasdaq Come on, NASDAQ, refresh for me. Down 95, 96 points at 11293.84%. All right, so markets, they're, they're fighting for that positive close. We're, we're not going to close in bear market territory on the S&P. The NASDAQ has been in bear market territory for some time. It belongs there because the NASDAQ was ridiculously overpriced. But it looks like the S&P has dodged that bullet at least for today. At least for today. All right, we'll revisit that beforehand. Let's see what the VIX. Oh, the VIX is just absolutely plummeting. 20, 29.62. Seemed like the VIX was moonbound earlier today. The vol sellers came in right before 33 on the VIX and took us lower. 
All right, there's something I do want to talk about here. Check out the oil chart today. All right, now I, I drew this flag pattern here a couple of weeks ago on my live stream. Talked about how we broke out of it. We retested it. Right down, right? We broke out here. We came down. We retested. And I mentioned, especially when I saw this bounce off of the 50-day moving average, that it looks like oil's heading higher here, folks. And you know what? There's a lot going on in oil markets right now that makes me inclined to say that. We've got the Saudi prince came out today and said we need drastically larger amounts of investment in the energy space or that even the OPEC, OPEC plus countries, which is OPEC and Russia, will not be able to supply the world with enough oil. All right? That came from the Saudi prince directly today. We have got China is reopening Shanghai, supposedly on June 1st. Believe that when I see it. But if that happens, if China reopens Shanghai, you're going to see oil consumption resume because, man, you've got a lot of boats waiting to load there. That's a lot of ships, a lot of weight that's going to start moving around the world again. That's going to be consuming a lot of fuel, right? I mean, this, this very mild pattern that oil has been trading in really since the start of the war, right? We had that big spike, but then we've kind of just come down, take away this big spike here at the beginning of March, and we've kind of been range bound between 115 and the high 90s, right? Well, we're pushing the higher end of that boundary right now, and we've got China's reopening. And the, the underlying situation in Eastern Europe has only gotten worse. It hasn't improved at all. So I think oil's going higher here, folks. I really do. I think it's going a lot higher from here. We're certainly not investing anymore in the oil space. I, I mean, the, the, the people who exempted themselves from the aviation fuel tax are still running things. They're still using our money, our retirement, to blackmail banks into not lending for any kind of capital development in the oil and gas space. They're using our retirements to do that. That's nice of them, isn't it? Use our retirement, our money, as blackmail fodder in order to get them to deny CapEx to the oil and gas space. And then when oil and gas prices go up, they implement a new climate change tax and then they exempt themselves from it. God, I love, these guys are great, aren't they? Thank God we have them in charge making decisions for all of us. These guys are awesome. Mish, I can hear him again. Jack, don't do it. Don't get yourself in trouble again. Take a look at the XLE. This is the ETF that I've been following for a while. Uh, now, this one invests in oil stocks. Let's get my melon out of the way here. Put me down here. And we are right now just kind of fighting to, to stay above this trend line. You know, it was support for a while as we came up for most of the year. We dipped back below it. The 50-day moving average held us up here. And now we're just kind of bouncing around this line. Not really sure where we want to go from here. Again, I think oil is still going higher. But you got to keep in mind, XLE... This is an ETF that is made up of oil stocks, okay? It's not just oil. They don't invest in oil futures. They buy Chevron. They buy Exxon. They buy Devon. They buy, jeez, uh, oh, I had the name of Marathon. You know, companies like that, ConocoPhillips. So those stocks could be dragged lower by the overall indexes being sold off far and wide. So this one is swimming against the tide of the broader market sell-off, but still it's been marching higher even as this market has been selling off, right? I mean, take a look at what this one has done since mid-April when this crash really picked up steam. It's gotten more volatile, but it's still moving higher. So I'm still liking this one. Um, another energy trade I've been following has been Chenier Energy, ticker LNG. This is the, uh, the liquefied natural gas company. They buy American gas, they liquefy it, and then they sell it into Europe and Asia where it sells for much higher. This one, I drew this double top last week. It's not a very good looking chart. And I had highlighted here that the 50 day moving average had failed as support. And here we are, we are still trading well below that one. So um, I sold this one a couple of, I guess about two, three weeks ago, I sold this one. I'm still not in back in it. I do want to get back into this one, but the technicals don't look very good, even though the macroeconomic story is very good for this one, um, with the caveat that I see the arbitrage between American natural gas and European nat natural gas is starting to shrink somewhat, right? This is U.S. natural gas prices, and you can see since the start of the Russian invasion, right, these gas prices have just risen continuously higher. 
you know, starting in the beginning of March, we were down around 450 per million BTUs. Now we're up at 810. So U.S. gas prices have nearly doubled. Now, European gas prices, on the other hand, this is the Henry Hub we're looking at here, the U.S. price, but the European prices, this chart, a little wonky, right? We had this huge, huge spike at the start of the Russian invasion here. And then we came back down and we've been just kind of trading in this, this tight range ever since. It hasn't really moved. Now, I can tell you this European natural gas price here, this does not pass the sniff test to me. All right. You've heard me mention the sniff test on this channel a lot. You pull some food out of the fridge, you open it up, you smell it and it stinks. Don't eat it. Right. This doesn't make sense to me. These European natural gas prices should be far, far higher than they are right now. They're not trading as if Europe was about to run out of gas. And Europe is about to run out of gas. Europe cannot, cannot gas itself. So this tells me a couple of things. Number one, Europe is still getting their gas from Putin. They are. They're, they're still buying it. Maybe they're buying it through some third party who's marking it up a little bit and then selling them the same gas that they're buying from Russia. Uh, but without Russian gas, this wouldn't be here, right? Prices would be back up here if there was no Russian gas, all right? Now, the other thing I want to point out, and I pointed to this the last time I did a live stream, you've got this big spike here in September, and then you got this big spike here in December, and you got this big spike here in March, all right? This volatility in each time the amplitude of the move is getting bigger. Now we settle back down right around this, this mean, the same price, but the spikes get bigger every time. And the geopolitical situation in Europe continues to get worse. And look at the duration here, you know, September, December, March. We're due for another one in June, aren't we? So I'm watching this one because of that LNG stock that I want to get back into. I think we're due for another big, big spike in these ice Dutch natural gas futures. This is the benchmark European gas price, All right? If it follows this pattern of these three month big swings in volatility, and, and I don't know, is this, is this European banks are somehow suppressing the futures price? Are they extending credit to the shorts to keep them from having to cover? I don't know why this three month spike cycle is happening the way it is. All I know is it looks like another one in June. If I see that, if I see what looks like the beginnings of another spike like that, I will probably pile back into this one, ticker symbol LNG, again, Chenier Energy, because I think that will be fuel to bring this one higher. Now, in the meantime, the markets continue to drag this one lower because American gas prices keep rising, even though European prices aren't. That's the profit margins from this company getting compressed, although they are way, way higher compared to where they were even a year ago. So that's my story about LNG. All right, guys, we're two minutes away from market close right now. Let's see where we're at. Are we going to close in positive territory? Oh, man, we are right there, aren't we? We are down one point. Nope, there we go. S&P is green. Look at that rally in the close from 30... Well, let's go all the way back from a low of 38.11 to almost 3,900, 39.01. We still got a minute to trade. We could possibly go higher. The Dow's now up 14.7 points or about five basis points. And the NASDAQ, even the NASDAQ might close in the green today. Uh, probably not. They're not going to make up 30 points in a minute. That would be pretty spectacular. So the NASDAQ's going to stay red where it belongs. The S&P and the Dow still fighting for positive territory. We'll see. But wow, I, I was not expecting that. Again, we've got options expiring right now. There's a lot of stock changing hands. There's a lot going on. Apparently, we're going higher from here. Crude oil, 112.70. Didn't talk about the metals at all today. Gold is at 1862. 1842, excuse me. Silver at 2174. Heck of a day on Wall Street. Now, 4 o'clock, markets are closed. S&P ends up closing at 39.01, not even a point higher, but basically even for the day. Wow. How about that? Crazy day, folks. The Dow ends up closing up 7.5 points, not even 0.2% at 31.260.
And the NASDAQ, NASDAQ closed down 33 points. Wild ride for today, folks. Uh, I've got Mike Bender from Robonashi Models again in the super chat. Thank you, Mike. It says TTF spikes are quarterly options delta hedge rollover. Same what we had seen today, but that was just a monthly rollover. Interesting, Mike. Thank you for that. Quarterly options delta. I have to look at when the next quarterly rollover is then. See the date exactly because, man, those were big spikes. Those are big spikes. Let's bring that ice chart back. Those are big spikes, and they all lasted a couple of days. I mean, these are one-week candles. Right? I mean, even if we put them on daily candles, these spikes lasted more than a day, that's for sure. I mean, that's that's almost eight, nine days there before it came back down. But I gotta thank you for that insight, Mike. I gotta go look and see when do those uh when do those futures what did you say? Quarterly options delta hedge rollover. All right, quarterly options. I gotta go look at those. I've never looked into that. Thank you, Mike. See, I have the best subscribers. You guys you guys make me so much better at this. That is fantastic. And thanks again for the super chat, brother. I really appreciate that. And whoa, Mr. Lloyd Brett. Hello, Lloyd Brett. Thank you for your super chat, sir. What does he say? With Walmart and Target bad earnings, what does that really mean for the market? It seems like we've had more headwinds coming with tightening. I'm sorry, let me repeat that. It seems like we have more headwinds coming with tightening coming. Yes, Lloyd, definitely. Um, and, and thank you very much for your support of the channel. So Walmart and Target, what's happening there is it, it was really an inflation story with those retailers. All right, Walmart and Target. They're, they've been trying for years to do this pivot to grocery. It's never really worked out for them. They, they're they still mainly a retail, a merchandise, general merchandise retailer, right? They've got their apparel section, their hardware section. It's, it's, a, it's a big box store. And people just have less discretionary income now. They just have less. By the time they pay their rent, by the time they pay their, put gas in their tank, and by the time they eat, their salary hasn't gone up, but all those three things have gotten more expensive. That means there's less money to spend at Walmart at the end of the day. There's less money to play at spend at Target, and by extension, Amazon, and you know, Best Buy, all of them. There's just less money left over after the necessities are bought, and that means the retailers are going to get squeezed. Now, even with tightening coming, tightening, I don't know that tightening is really going to affect the retailers. Because I think the retailers are not being squeezed by higher rates. The retailers are being squeezed by inflation. However, the higher rates are going to result in layoffs. They're going to result in bankruptcies. So all this tightening that's coming and the higher interest rates, that's going to put people out of work. And if people are already struggling to make ends meet with buying food and gas and everything else, well, it's going to get even worse if they lose their jobs too, isn't it? So then they're going to have even less money to spend at Walmart and Target. So you're right, Lloyd. I mean, the, the Fed has already priced people out of any discretionary spending by inflating away their wages. And now, in order to fight that inflation, they're going to raise interest rates and you're going to lose your wages because you're going to lose your job. Not you specifically, just you being John Q. Consumer. So I don't see a lot of good on the horizon for the retailers. I don't. Not at all. Their, their overhead is going up. Their labor is getting more expensive. Their shoppers have less money to spend. They're struggling to get any kind of inventory through the door because the supply chain is a mess. I, I don't see any good thing on the horizon for the retailers. Let me put an asterisk on that. If they start up again with their ridiculous money printing and their stupid stimmies, if they start the helicopter money again, people are going to do the same thing they did with the helicopter money last time. They're going to go spend it on stupid crap. So if that happens, the retailers are probably going to run. So until that happens, until the printer turns on, I would not touch the retailers. So thank you very much, Lloyd Brett. That was a good question and your insight. You're, you're right on the money that with the tightening, that is also not good for the, for the retailers, although that's, that's bad for a whole different reason because that's going to hurt employment, which means also bad for the retailers. And Mr. Palm works. Palmworks US, thank you, sir, for your support of the channel and your super chat. He says, thanks for another great checkup today, brother. Keep crushing it. Well, thank you. I appreciate the kind words, sir. I appreciate you watching and your support of the channel. You guys are the best. Thank you so much. All right. One more thing I wanted to talk about today, um, and it's big. I've, I've been covering agriculture a lot on this channel, the food markets a lot on this channel, and it was, it was a pretty bad week 
for agricultural commodities, right? Um, my corn trades are down. My wheat trades are down. I'm still in them. I'll probably add to them very soon because although I see the futures have come down, I don't see any reason for it. All right. I, any macroeconomic reason, the, the situation for the global food supply has only gotten worse in the last week. It has definitely not gotten better, even though the prices have come down. All right, wheat is now at 1170, it's down 30, another 30 bucks today. Wheat rocketed higher earlier this week, and it's just come down pretty much from Tuesday on. Uh, corn back under 800 at 778. Um, my, my thesis with the agriculture story has always been about fertilizer and the fertilizer prices. And I just want to show you this. This is in uh, DTN Progressive Farmer. Uh, shown retail fertilizer prices. Fertilizer prices have crept down just a, ever so much. Just ever so much. Some fertilizer prices have crept down. All right. And you see this line here in red. This is average weekly urea prices for 2022. All right. That's the, the red line. And then the green line here, this is 2021 fertilizer prices. And then the purple line is 2020. All right, that puts into perspective just how much fertilizer prices have run. And to be honest with you, I think they're running even higher. I think they're going to run much higher because keep in mind, fertilizer is tied to energy. And we talked earlier about how energy prices were kind of trading sideways from that initial spike in March. And how with the Chinese unlocking Shanghai, that's going to add to more oil production or I'm sorry, more oil consumption that there is no new oil production coming online anytime soon. I mean, the, the world is right now busy blowing up oil production, right? You've got the Houthis are shooting at the Dubai and the Saudi oil fields. Who knows what the Iranians are going to do next? I mean, the, the Iranians could send oil to $300 a barrel like that if they decided they wanted to. So I don't see energy prices coming down anytime soon. And if energy prices stay high, that means fertilizer plants are not economic to operate without much higher prices. So fertilizer is tied to energy. Energy is not getting any better. Fertilizer is not getting any better. All right. So even though they've come down ever so slightly, just take a look at a couple of these things here. Diammonium phosphate at 1059 per ton. That's an all-time high. MAP is at 1083, an all-time high. Potash, not an all-time high. UAN, not an, oh, UAN, an all-time high, right? All these various fertilizers. Several of them are still making all-time highs, even though urea and what else, anhydrous ammonia was slightly down this week. So fertilizer prices, they have stopped rocketing higher on average. They are still staying at all-time highs. I don't think they're coming down. I think they might stay here a little bit, at least until energy legs up again and energy will leg up again. That's going to take fertilizer higher. That's going to make the food situation even worse. All right, and I want to show you a couple of things here. Uh, U.S. corn crop at risk of substantial prevent plant acres, grows model predicts. All right, now this is uh, from Grow Intelligence. And what a prevent plant is, if you don't follow agriculture too much, which I'm, I'm new to a lot of this stuff, but pre prevent plant is basically crop insurance for farmers, right? If there is this insurance fund that farmers pay into, and if the weather is unfavorable or if some you know, exigent circumstances prevents you from planting your crop, those farmers can declare a prevent plant and basically get a payout from this insurance company instead of growing food and selling it. And right now, the weather this spring has been so miserably cold and wet throughout the Corn Belt that the U.S. farmers are way, way behind in their corn planting season. And, and the other planting seasons are also behind, but corn in particular, because corn needs dry soil to plant. And it doesn't stop raining. And I was telling you about the thunderstorms over my head. I mean, nobody's planting out here. I'm in eastern P Pennsylvania. I'm on the far eastern tip of the Corn Belt here. And almost none of these fields in my area have been planted. I mean, they're just now starting to work the fields. The discus have been out. They've plowed them, right? But they still are not planting out here. And it just rained again today. And the, what do they call it? First decision is, for a lot of these states, is March 25th, when they basically... When they reach the decision point, am I going to prevent plant, collect the crop insurance, or am I going to go ahead 
and take the risk of planting, even though statistically my yield, if I plant late, is going to come in lower on top of what's going on with diesel prices, on top of what's going on with fertilizer prices and with labor prices. You know what? Screw it. I'll just take the crop insurance. See what's happening here? You see how this could make things so much worse for the food situation? And reading here, many corn farmers in the U.S. Northern Plains are being forced to decide whether to forego planting a significant portion of their crop because of saturated soils. Corn farmers in the Dakotas and Minnesota are well behind on planting due to heavy snow, followed by rain in April, and now spring flooding. Grows Prevent Plant Forecast Model for Corn predicts these states are vulnerable to getting substantially fewer acres than originally intended. Farmers generally carry insurance for acreage that is prevented from being planted. Now, we're already down 4 million, I think it was 4 million, about 4 million fewer acres of corn is going to be planted in the, United, in the U.S. this year just because of the higher fertilizer prices. And now we're talking potentially millions more acres might not get planted at all, and they might just take this crop insurance. That's even less corn hitting the market come harvest time. And, you know, the forecast for the Northern Plains, I mean, it just came out today, it's going to be wet again next week. So more days wasted before they can get anything in the ground. And what was the... Let me just read you a couple of these numbers here. This year's overly wet conditions. Hold on. Where is it? Here we go. Only 49% of the U.S. corn crop was planted as of May 15th. That's the slowest pace since the much wetter 2029 when only 30% was planted. North Dakota remains stalled at 4% planted compared with a five-year average of 41% planted. So they've only got 4% of the fields in North, North Dakota planted when there should be at 41%. In South Dakota, 31% of the crop is planted versus a five-year average of 54%. And in Minnesota, they're at 35% planted versus an average of 72%. Do you see this trend here? They're behind, and we're reaching that point where if they wait another few more days, their yield is coming down. It means they make less money. They might just give up and say, I'll take the insurance. I'm not even going to try this year. So that's very bad for corn supplies. That means an even tighter corn market means higher corn prices. That's why I'm not worried about what corn futures did this week. I'm not worried about what wheat futures did this week because I see this still going on on top of the fertilizer situation. Oh, and uh, by the way, diesels, 100% surge in scarcity denies farmers their lifeblood. This one, where was this? In Stars and Stripes today, farmers from Iowa to Ukraine are grappling with surging diesel prices in an unsteady supply, forcing them to spend unprecedented sums on fuel in a chaotic market and raising concerns about the autumn harvest. In the U.S., where corn and soybean producers are rushing to sow after rains and cold temperatures force delays, filling the tractor tank daily now costs some farmers $1,000, twice what it was a year ago. You guys see what I'm talking about here? These farmers are getting squeezed. From both sides, a lot of them, why pay the diesel? Why pay the fertilizer? Why not just take the insurance? Take the insurance, take the year off. It's easier for these guys to do that, unfortunately. Why would they work their tails off? You know, tough life, man. It's tough life. My hat's off. Any of you guys that are farmers out there, my hat's off to you. That is a tough life, man. That is a tough line of work. And, uh, I, heck, I don't think I could do it. I've done some some tough work in my day, but not now. Anyways, I see Mr. Matt the Cheeseburger says, I slept in and missed the show, but here's five bucks New Zealand for your trouble. Well, good morning, Matt. Nice of you to join us. Good morning, Cheeseburger. I'm kidding. Thanks, brother. No problem. You can always go back and watch it from the beginning just as soon as the stream is over. Don't forget to like and subscribe while you're here, by the way. Mr. Alexander, thank you, sir, for the super chat. He sends 50 S-E-K. I don't know what that currency is. That's interesting. He says, what do you think about Michael Saylor and MicroStrategy? If USDT fails and Bitcoin falls, he gets liquidated at around $22,000 per Bitcoin. What would this trigger? So I don't know how much Bitcoin MicroStrategy actually bought, to be honest with you. I haven't followed Saylor all that closely. Um, 
I do know, though, that he has become this mouthpiece, this figurehead for Bitcoin, right? So Mike Saylor getting liquidated will be a major psychological defeat for the Bitcoin bulls. And that could cause some panic selling, all right? If, if Saylor gets liquidated, a lot of people are going to get liquidated along with them because a lot of other people are going to sell. And again, the, the Bitcoin market is not, it's not that liquid. There's, there's really not that much Bitcoin changing hands at, at any given time. Most of the Bitcoin existence in existence, it just sits in cold storage wallets. It's not actually on the exchanges up for sale. So that much Bitcoin hitting the market, that could take us way below 22,000 in a hurry. Absolutely, Alexander. Um, as far as how low that would go, I've been saying for a while, I think 17, 18,000 is the bottom for this crypto winter cycle. Although we're at 28 now, and if, if Tether were to blow up, that's that big if, that's that, that big question mark. If Tether blows up, I don't know, maybe even my lows aren't, wouldn't do it justice. But again, that does not change my long-term view. I think at the end of this decade, Bitcoin will be over a million dollars. I've been saying that since the start of this channel, still say it now. Um, even that, even if Tether were to blow up tomorrow, I would still say the same thing, All right? That's why my strategy is always to buy a little bit on a regular basis, put it in cold storage. I use the Ledger Nano. That is my cold storage wallet of choice. There is an affiliate link in the description down below to that, if you feel so inclined. Um, but that's my, that's my approach to Bitcoin. Again, it's not we're in crypto winter, folks. Bitcoin's not going to do anything exciting other than crash for probably the next year, year and a half. But that's part of the cycle. We've been here before. We'll be here again. All right. This Tether and all these guys, they're not the first frauds in the crypto space. They won't be the last. But thank you, Alexander. I really appreciate the uh, support of the channel. There's my man above my pay grade. What's up above my pay grade? Loving the channel, brother. Another one from the Ninja Nation. Check out above my pay grades channel when you get a chance, folks. He, he's another guy. Uh, um, was it Dallas or Denver that we met above my pay grade? I can't remember. I know you were at one of them. I, I can't put them. There was the two that we did kind of back to back in, over this winter. But above my pay grade says the world is going to die from the sun monster in 12 years. Just ask <laughs> AOC. <laughs> yes, please. Let's, let's take our energy and economic advice from a bartender. Yes, that's what we should do. Thank you above my pay grade. Uh, man, I could go off on I could go off on on that one. Um, but again, after everything I said about the uh, the the green tax on aviation fuel and the exemption, I probably already got myself in trouble today. I don't need to do it again. You're gonna get you guys are getting me all spun up, man. Thank you very much above my pay grade. Keep it up with the channel, man. Keep up the good work over there. Check out above my pay grades channel on YouTube, folks. There's another one from the Ninja Nation. All right, guys, it's 418. I've been going for an hour and three minutes. I'll go for another two hours and three minutes if you let me. But you know what? The weekend is here. It's been an awesome week. Uh, I say this a lot. I'm going to keep saying it. There are difficult times ahead, folks. Um, I'm one of those perma bear types, right? I don't, I don't often bring you good news. But the good news is those times, those bad times, they're not here yet. All right. So I want you to go have an awesome, awesome weekend. Hug your family close. Call your friends. Call your mom. Hi, mom. I love you guys. Uh, have an awesome weekend because tough times are coming. They're not here yet. We don't know how long it's going to be before we have it this good again. So let's make the most of it. Let us have an awesome, awesome weekend while we can. Let us live vicariously through our past selves by enjoying this weekend. So, hey, you know, six months from now, when everything's in the can, we can say, you know what? Back in May, remember how awesome that weekend was? Man, that was cool. We can go do that. So that's your homework, everybody. Go have an awesome weekend. And until next time, thank you so much to everybody for your super chats. Thank you guys for watching. Thank you to all my Patreon supporters, guys. I really appreciate everything you guys do for the channel. I couldn't do this without you. And until next time, live small and dream big.